Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. It's November. It's actually been November for a while now. Yep. But anyway, it's still November and we haven't done our monthly Q&A yet. So we thought we'd squeeze it in at the end of the month as we often do. Quite a few questions. Tim's picked most of them. So we'll see what he has in store for us. Let's get into it. Okay, first question's coming from Jeremy of our Discord chat. Stephen, Tim, how long do you think the 1920 by 1080 resolution will last before it's outdated? And what will replace it instead? We've got 2560 by 1440 or 3840 by 2160, which is 4K. Uh, yeah, so out of those resolutions and how long's 1080p gonna be around for you reckon? Probably still for quite a while. I mean, they're super affordable monitors with 1080p mm -hmm. at the moment. So it's hard to see you know, them not being the budget option for at least a few more years. 1440p is definitely getting a lot cheaper, especially high refresh is now mm. certainly quite affordable. So we're getting there with 1440p, but I think a lot of people are trying to make 4K happen. They're trying to, trying to push it really hard. It's yeah, like yeah. 4K gaming is the thing, especially on the consoles, but I don't see that happening for certainly a long time. So out of those three candidates, definitely 1440p will be the next one. Because it has to be in the budget scope to be, you know, the next big thing, really. So, yeah, I think 1440. What do you reckon? Yeah, no, that sounds right to me. Basically, we'll need another generation or two of GPUs because you want 1440p to become extremely easy for something like your equivalent of what would be like an RX 560 or a, a GTX 1050 to handle that with ultra quality type settings. So it'll be a generation or two before that's possible, of course quality settings in games become more demanding at the same time. So it's kind of hard to catch up. We're not sort of catching up to the point that we're at right now, which is why it's such a slow thing to do. And as you, Tim said, once you uh, invest in a monitor, you're not too keen to upgrade your monitor. Most people focus on their graphics cards and CPUs. A lot of people, at least the people I know, tend to buy a monitor and keep it for many, many years. Yep. So it's not until we get a lot of people upgrading to 1440p. It's basically how it works. So once uh, the masses deem 1440p worth investing in. That's when we'll see a shift to that resolution. Okay, Jeremy set us up again with another question from our Discord chat. Uh, how long do you think is left before the silicon finally hits its pinnacle limit? What is the smallest possible node we will see? And what do you think will replace or supplement the silicon in the future? Will such replacement or supplement increase the price? or cause possible performance drop at all? Well, hmm. I think for the last two questions, will it increase the price or cause performance drops? It's probably a bit early to say uh, for those things. Certainly we're talking about a long time in the future. It seems the general consensus for this is that there's at least a couple more nodes left to go on silicon. So five nanometers and three or 3.5 nanometers tends to be the next two steps. And then researchers have done some pretty exotic and crazy things to get it down to like one nanometer. But at that point, it definitely seems like silicon is kind of hitting hitting the limit of what's possible in terms mm -hmm. of node shrinks. So it's possible in the future we'll see things like carbon nanotubes, which has been, I'm sure you've heard of carbon nanotubes talked about a lot in terms of replacing silicon. But again, that's all in sort of the research phase. So if people at you know, universities and all that are still researching these technologies, then we're probably not talking about that in consumer products for a long time. So yeah, still a couple more nodes to go, but it certainly is approaching the sort of end of life for, for silicon. Okay, this next question is also from our Discord chat from Sal Kagan. Uh, what kind of things would you guys like to see other than AMD stuff at CES in January? Uh, <laughs> do you got anything? <laughs> I think a lot of the excitement will be AMD stuff because we're not going to get anything from Intel. We're not going to get anything from NVIDIA, are we? That's nah. kind of the big three. Yeah, well, that's all that I really seem to care about. Do you like about. washing machines? Because they talk about those. Samsung loves new washing machines and refrigerators to I talk about. I just bought a new washing machine, so that takes a lot of the fun out of that one. Um, there'll be some new monitors, I think. Uh, there's some talk about maybe Samsung releasing a new set of monitors using their Curve VA stuff. So, I mean, that's really what one of the big things that CES is for, but... Again, I mean, are we really that excited about new cases or like coolers? I mean, that's not that exciting, let's be honest. So No, not really. Well, I'm not personally. Some of the viewers may be, but I'm yeah. certainly not. So um, yeah, for me, it's definitely the, the seven nanometer stuff for sure. Yeah. Okay, Brandon asks us, for 1440p gaming with the performance gap ever so close between Intel and AMD, does Ryzen make the absolute best choice across their product line? Um... 
Well, you well, across AMD's product line, it does. Unless you have a twenty eighty Ti, which we're starting to see get CPU bottlenecked at fourteen forty p. If you have like a ninety nine hundred K, yeah, that's true. So, um, so yeah, you might need ninety nine hundred K or something like that for that. But across, aside from having that high end GPU, then yeah, at the pricing that Ryzen's at, at the moment, it's very very affordable uh, compared to Intel CPUs, which are still. Not well, great in terms of pricing. Yeah, Intel CPUs are hands down better. We fully admit that yep. at Harbour and Boxes. We're not biased one way or the other. We really don't care. Uh, Intel CPUs are definitely better, no doubt about it. But for most of you, you're not going to notice that difference, and then yep. they're not worth the price premium. But if you're after the absolute latest and greatest, you've got RTX 2080 Ti money, then you might as well buy... Well, you might as well buy 900K. I was going to say 8700K, but you might as well buy 9900K. But if you want to get something like, you know, an RTX 2070 or a GTX 1070, 1080, Vega 64, something around there, then a Ryzen processor, for most games will be okay. Yeah, especially at 1440p. Especially at 1440p. It changes a bit at 1080p. would probably recommend Intel if you're going more for, yeah. at 1080p, especially yep. with higher-end GPUs. But yeah, for 1440p, it's pretty hard to ignore the value that Ryzen... Is yeah. presenting at the moment. And assuming at 1440p you're not using like competitive settings in Battlefield 5 or 4. Yeah, exactly, or, or like you're that. just playing CSGO or something mm. like that. So, yeah, as always, it depends. I mean, value for money, they're just, you know, the Ryzen 5 2600 at $160 US is just mind-blowing. Yeah. If you, if you took someone back in a time machine two years and said in two years' time you'll get six core 12-thread CPUs for the price of a Core i3, you'd just laugh after yeah. the five years we had of quad cores. Or whatever it was. Another Discord question here. How has the 1800X, I'm guessing the Ryzen 7 1800X, how has that aged since launch? Uh, uh, pretty good, I suppose. Well, we've been testing it in a lot of our day one coverage. I think we would have done it for, well, we definitely did it for the second gen Ryzen stuff. Haven't monitored it super closely, but obviously since Ryzen first launched, there was quite rapid improvements. Yeah. Uh, recently, not so much, but yeah, it's a little bit slower than second gen. It works well. Memory compatibility has improved a bit. That's mainly through motherboard support, BIOS updates and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, it's aged reasonably well since launch. It's not radically different. No. Um, it's still a very capable yeah. processor. So yeah. yeah, I think it's probably aged pretty well. We are only like less than two years on though, so you think... expect a CPU to last at least that. Oh, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure if the question so much about how is it still working okay? I yeah. think it's more how has it developed and has it got a lot better in oh, regards it's to definitely, its competing? It's, it's gotten better. better. I think with at the time it was the 7700K that was competing with for games. Yeah. It's fair to say that the 7700K still buries it in pretty much every single game. And I think that was the argument between your sort of Intel fans and your AMD fans. You know, yep. AMD guys were like, it's got twice as many cores, therefore, you know, in the future it's going to be much better, which is probably true. Uh, then the Intel guys was arguing whatever they are arguing. I'm sort of in the middle trying to be, make a reasonable logic argument for both sides. And I think the problem with the 1800X is all the things that we covered. It needs to be better utilised. It needs to take advantage of you know, the architecture and the way that that CPU works. Um, I think things like scheduling and that Windows has improved for it. But it still has the latency issues that it had. And that's an inherent problem. And that's why the 7700K is much better for gaming. And I think it's going to be quite a few more years before we see the 1800X beating the 7700K in modern titles. Okay, this comment is from our community tab on YouTube. Uh, Sai says, how do I recognize the quality of a motherboard? I'm talking about the difference in Verum cooling, uh, overclocking headroom, uh, etc. The motherboards within the same price bracket. Um, well... Basically, to answer that one, you've really got to do your research. Uh, there's not too many things just looking at the board, how it would be presented in sort of marketing photos and things like that. Obviously, you can tell how many features it has, what they're claiming the VRM's like. That can be a bit misleading, as we've seen. Uh, the cooling, obviously, the size of the heat sink's a bit of a giveaway there if it's finned versus just a slab of aluminium. Uh, but probably more important, really, is the quality of the VRM components or the components that make up the VRM. Um, and overclocking headroom, that's a pretty difficult one to say because a lot of things go into overclocking, not just the VRM itself and the cooling of the VRM, but then 
the BIOS is very important, the, the features offered, how well they work. So you've got to do a lot of research is basically, yeah, the the short version of that. Back watch some hardware unbox content. You've got to watch some hardware unbox content. You've got to watch other people like Gamers Nexus and, well, there's tons of YouTube channels that do a good job of covering motherboards. There's endless tech sites that do a good job of covering them. So there should be plenty of sources um, and plenty of coverage of whatever motherboard it is that you're looking at. Okay, next question. What is the highest or fastest GPU I can pair with a Ryzen 5 2600 processor? Um, Depends on the resolution, you'd think. I was going to say, that's a tricky one. There's a few things. It's resolution, the frame rates you're targeting. So whether you're going for ultra quality or you're going for higher frame rates with medium. And again, that depends on your, your GPU. So there's, yeah, resolution, quality settings, and GPU, and games. Yep. So there's, yeah, at least four key things there uh, that you need to sort of address before you can answer this question. But as a general let's say 1080p because that's a as low as you're very really common going. yeah yep. it's and then if it's 1080p with a gtx 1060 or rx 580 um you'll be gpu limited for the most part there uh 1080p probably looking at becoming cpu limited with like your gtx 1080s and i'm talking about very cpu intensive games here not your fours of um horizon four sort of titles uh more your battlefield 5 multiplayer let's say or Hitman 2, stuff like that. Yep. Um, but yeah, a Ryzen 5 2600 would be fine with a Vega 64 or GTX uh, 1080. And then even with something crazy like an RTX uh, 2080 Ti. Again, Forza, no worries. Any GPU limited games. 4K gaming. 4K gaming, yep. not a problem as well. So yeah, you've really got to be after high refresh rate gaming uh, at like 1440p. Uh, in CPU intensive games to really question CPU performance yep. in gaming. Next question here, are the high-end 10 series cards irrelevant now? What I mean is the 2070 and 1080 have similar price and performance and the 2070 has an extra feature even though the performance for it is terrible. Is there any point in buying the 1080 instead of the 2070? Well, soon you won't be able to buy 1080s. It seems like all that stock from 1070 Ti-ish area all the way up yeah, from Pascal or pretty much I think the 1080 the Ti's out. are done and the 1080's are pretty much on the way out as well, yeah. Um, to answer the first part of that question, we have no problem with the RTX range. They're, they're perfectly fine. I mean, there's been a few hiccups here and there with certain things. But uh, with the 2070 versus 1080 comparison, we would always recommend you buy the 2070 over the 1080. At the same price. At the same price. Uh, if it's a hundred, two hundred dollars more, then definitely not. But uh, as you say, the the twenty seventies are now down at five hundred dollars, and I think the cheapest without sales or whatever it was like four eighty or something for yeah. the the, the uh, ten eighty. So five hundred dollars for twenty seventy, which they're currently at, is perfectly reasonable, and we would definitely recommend that product because there are some advantages to the, the refined uh, Turing architecture. You've got ray tracing, but on an RTX twenty seventy, you, you don't really have yeah. ray tracing. DLSS is also probably going to be a bust. Pretty questionable um, at this point. Very questionable at this point. Yeah. I mean, the problem with the RTX cards was that they launched at a higher price than the Pascal mm, cards. So, yeah. again, back at launch, a 1080, or especially with like a 1080 Ti versus a 2080, it made a lot more sense to buy the Pascal card. But obviously, when those cards are not in the market or they're at the same price, yeah, you may as well just buy the newer card. With graphics cards, it's rare that you actually have a flat out bad product. I can't think of. Well, I mean, uh, with, without it's going like GT ten thirty, without, without yeah, without going to extremes where they've like rebranded or repurposed things to make them terrible, you generally don't get bad products. It's just bad prices, and the RTX series isn't bad. It's very impressive in a number of ways. It was just a very bad launch price. Yeah. So, yeah, I would definitely be buying a twenty seventy over a ten eighty at five hundred dollars. Okay, next question. It is from Discord as well. This one. I think we will see chiplet-based AMD GPUs soon. Okay, that was rumoured for Navi a while back, but that's been yeah. squashed now, hasn't it? I mean, who knows? Yeah. I... We don't really have insight into sort of what their architecture changes are going to be because they keep that stuff pretty close to their, their chest until until yeah. launch. I mean, we're seeing it on the CPU side, and they've, AMD's done a lot of work with chiplet designs and multi-die designs across a lot of their products, so it wouldn't surprise me if... An AMD GPU in the future used it, 
But how soon? Yeah, it's it, impossible for us to say. It really. seems somewhat inevitable, but yeah, whether it's going to be in a year or many years. Yep. This is an interesting question from YouTube. Opinions on the leaked PS5 information claiming that they would target 4K 60fps in 2020 and run an 8-core, my guess, 7 nanometer Zen 2 CPU in it. Again, hard to know for sure what these, how accurate these leaks are because we're still quite a way away from 2020. It's a big leap. Um, so we've still got like an entire year to go before they'll likely be even announcing the PlayStation 5. So for the, the last part about, you know, an 8-core Zen 2 7 nanometer CPU, that would make a lot of sense because that because it's highly likely they'll continue to use AMD semi-custom division to make an APU for that console. And an 8-core 7 nanometer Zen 2 CPU is probably around the mark of what will be reasonably affordable at that point in time sure i mean it's more the gpu that we're concerned so, about yeah I and mean, th that seems fairly straightforward the gpu targeting 4k 60 fps in 2020 in a console seems pretty unlikely i think so we're seeing at the moment with a console like an xbox one x for example which uses the fastest sort of semi-custom amd apu that 4k 30 is within the realms of possibility depending on the quality settings depending on the game mm -hmm. Uh, some games still use, you know, dynamic resolution scaling. Some of them still use things like temporal rendering, checkerboard rendering to get 4K. So we're kind of at that point where, again, it depends on the game. You're sort of teetering around 4K with, that, with their premium price console. So we're talking like $500 US, so mm -hmm. not the base model. So to, to think, would an upper tier PS5 have double the performance compared to a console that launched five years ago in two years from now, so a seven-year gap? Could they do double the performance to get 4K60 in some games? It seems possible. Certainly seems possible. But again, that would be comparing an upper tier model available now to a base model that would be launched in 2020. So yeah. I think... Well, we'd have a better idea next year. We'd definitely have a better idea next year what's possible. I mean, for example, if they're making a console today and they pull something that's sort of in that affordable GPU price category, even something like a 1070, let's say, and they put that in a console still not capable of really good 4K 60 FPS gaming. No, you get a lot of trimming off the top on that one. So, yeah, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if Sony and Microsoft announce consoles that claim to do 4K 60, but then, again, it will come down to, like with the Xbox One X launch where they announced it being 4K capable, mm -hmm. it's really only in some situations where that's true. So yeah, sure. I think that's, again, that's all speculation. We're not really you know, in touch with Sony or Microsoft about these things, but mm -hmm. that's probably giving you a good idea of what to expect in two years from now. Okay, Toby asks us, why do CPU manufacturers not use liquid metal? And same question for GPUs. Ooh, I should have researched this one a little bit more. Okay, off the top of my head, um, well, I imagine cost is one reason. Yep. Um, probably not the biggest reason, but it would be one. It's significantly more expensive than you just cheap thermal paste that they usually use or whatever thermal interface material they use uh so there's what well, we got we got cost the fact that thermal uh sorry liquid metal is quite dangerous for electrical components in the sense that it's highly conductive so if any leaks out or there's a bit of over uh, you know it's used excessively uh and it leaks onto the surface mount stuff or even further yeah. then it's going to destroy the card so you have to be quite careful with that stuff. Um, and then probably, well, a third, I don't know if it's the biggest reason, can be longevity. So I've I've heard plenty of cases where people have delitted their CPUs and within a year the stuff's dried up and it just, the thermals go through the roof. Uh, so you've got to worry about that as well. Good thermal pastes have a very long lifespan, um, a decade plus. So yeah, cost, uh, what would you put on the hey how dangerous how easy it is to yeah, apply and that sort pra of thing pract how practical it is i suppose and then yeah longevity um and it's also it can i i'm i'm not 100 sure on this one don't quote me i've seen some tests um it's not great on the silicon oh, straight on top of it it sort of eats away at it slightly i'm not not 100 sure okay. on that i know it does cloud it up i don't know if that's a problem I haven't seen any long-term tests. And it can also, with certain metals as well, react as well. So you get 
Um, I don't know it's, it's definitely an enthusiast. It's thing. Def- yeah, it's definitely something that needs a bit of maintenance and it's not just slap it on and yep. away you go. So that's probably the main reason. Yep. Nick asks us on our Discord chat, following on from my question last month, when you guys have tested high core count CPUs like the 2950X and 7980XE, have you come across any games that refuse to work on such a high core count CPU purely because of the number of threads the CPU has available? Huh. Uh, I'm sure there's probably a game that throws up some sort of warning or something. I think when I was testing the 2990WX or the... 2950x for the first time or even the 1950x last year i think one or two games came up with like the unsupported or you know can't detect what type of cpu you're using so you may not be using something that's optimal for this game so i think maybe we got prompted but i don't recall anything not working yeah um that mean there was games that certainly ran like garbage because Mm -hmm. they you know couldn't work out what was going on but I don't think there was any that actually refused to launch. I've obviously seen that with dual core processors now, but core heavy CPUs, I don't think so. Do you recall any? No, I don't think so. Okay, another question from Discord. What is the oldest graphics cards that you currently have, and how big is your GPU collection? Well, <laughs> I'll let you start on that one. Oh, well, my, my graphics card collection is not very impressive. So something You're like building up your collection though. Yeah, but mine sort of starts in Pascal era, so mm-hmm. that's kind of you know like a ten seventy. Well, I've well, only got half a dozen to a dozen cards now. Oh yeah, I've got like a GTX ten eighty, got like a Pas- Titan X Pascal. So that'd probably be my oldest, but certainly not. Oh, <laughs> actually, in I've got an older gaming system that's got like an HD seven thousand series GPU okay. yep. in this house. So mm-hmm. that's probably the oldest. Okay, well, I can't really answer what's the oldest in mine because I've got AGP graphics cards and PCI graphics cards, and that's not PCI Express, that's PCI, (laughs) the big old white slots. Uh, So I don't really know. I know the first graphics card I ever bought, which was a Voodoo Banshee 16 megabyte. I think I still have that as well. But the oldest cards I use for testing is probably like your RX, no, GTX. Yeah, GTX 480. Uh, Fermi based stuff. Yeah, uh, I don't think I test with anything older than that. And then the the you know the HD seven thousand series. I definitely basically anything that can't support DirectX eleven we don't use anymore for yeah. obvious reasons. Yeah. Uh, as for the number of graphics cards in my current arsenal, uh, it'd be coming up around a hundred, probably yep. around a hundred. I've got I've got about six shelves that are about four meters long, and they're just stacked. I think I've put a photo up before of it. But yeah, I've got a lot. Basically, when I do my 50 to 60, they're getting up to 60 now. I did 57 for Hitman. Oh, I, I got, a, got a cut back. Uh, no, I do, actually. Um, I, when, I, when I do those big benchmark videos, I spend the most time looking for graphics cards because you'd think I would just label the shelves and put them in the same spot, but I don't have that much room, so I've sort of... I can lay out some nicely that are easy to grab, and other ones I actually have to stack in yep. like piles because I just don't have that much shelving real estate to house up to 100 graphics cards so yeah i spend a lot of time trying to find my gtx 750 ti that thing took me like 20 minutes to find for the hitman i think i wasted some time on that but anyway plenty of graphics cards okay that is going to do it for part one of november's q a hope you guys enjoyed all the questions there was a few good ones there and we will have part two probably on the channel tomorrow tim's going to be editing those two together so hopefully he's on it and yeah thanks for watching uh, like, they can subscribe. Subscribing is a good thing possible to do. on YouTube, yep. yeah. Yep, subscribe. Uh, you can even donate to us on Patreon. Though it's not really donating. It's more supporting us on Patreon and getting access to some cool perks like our Discord chat, our monthly live streams. We did two of them today. They were a lot of fun. And that's about all I can think of for now. So I'm going to wrap this one up. All right, cool. Bye. No, I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time. <laughs>